name is Richard Walker. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the National Center for Policy Analysis, one of the co-sponsors of this morning's conference about uh, rare earths and the critical metals that we know exist and that we need, and those implications for national security. The other of our co-sponsors is the American Resources Policy Network and U.S. Rare Earths. We're also happy to have Logic International and Rubenstein PR to help us out in today's effort. Today, we're going to talk a lot about these critical metals, these high-tech and green-tech minerals, the supply of them in the United States and across the world, what our strategy is or what our strategy should be, how our strategic needs are, are going to be met or need to be met, and what some of our larger implications for not only domestic energy policy, but worldwide energy policy, and for our national security. And one of the more important sessions today is going to be what our legislative options are. Senator Murkowski of Alaska, Representatives Kaufman and Lamborn, both of Colorado, will be here to speak. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hear what they have to say. We also have some publications out front, <clears throat> some of the latest publications on this issue. So if you did not pick the, one of those up on the way in, please try to get one here pretty soon or let someone know we'll get one for you. So without further ado, I'd like to get to the first panel and uh, NCPA senior fellow Sterling Burnett will be moderating this panel. Thank you. Um, a few uh, notes of operation. First, I'll tell you a little bit why we are involved. I do the energy and environmental policy work for the NCPA. Um, and a little over a year ago, I uh, began to, um, I do a lot of research on green energy technologies and uh, in particular, um, the, uh, the high cost and environmental problems with green energy technologies. But I began to realize there was a third uh, drawback to green energy technologies and that was they were increasing our dependence upon China for critical minerals, rare earths. And I looked around and I didn't see that any of my colleagues had written about this topic, so I decided it was time that I do so. Uh, I've updated that publication. The publication that is uh, out on the table that Richard mentioned is uh, uh, a new piece on it, it's sort of an overview of, uh, of uh, what the problem is and uh, uh, a brief discussion of different uh, possible policy responses. Uh, short time ago, um, Dan got a hold of us, Dan McGordy, and uh, started talking about having a conference. And we decided we wanted to talk about both the uh, policy and the commercial um, side of the rare earth issue. So that's why we're here today. Um, I will introduce each of the speakers. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on them right up front. I won't do, do it before each of their speeches. Let them go, then we'll open it for questions and answers. We'll try and hold them to around 12 minutes, give plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, when the question and answer period comes, I will recognize the, uh, the people with questions. I ask that you wait until the microphone reaches you before you ask your question so everyone can hear it. Um, and I'll ask that you make your questions uh, you know, as concise as possible and directed, if possible, to particular, a particular panelist rather than the panelist as a whole. Our first speaker is Dr. Gareth Hatch. Gareth is the founding principal of Technology Metals Research, provider of market intelligence, commentary, and analysis on critical and strategic materials such as rare earths and other technology metals. He's also president and director of Innovation Metals Corp. A startup provider of downstream processing and marketing services with particular focus on rare earths. For several years, Gareth was director of technology at Dexter Magnetic Technologies. He holds five US patents on a variety of magnetic devices. A two-time graduate of the University of Birmingham in the UK, Gareth has a BA in engineering with honors in material science and technology and a PhD in metallurgy and materials, focused on rare earth permanent magnet materials. He's a fellow of the Institute of Materials and Mining, a fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, a chartered engineer, and a senior member of the IEEE. Gareth is a founding editor of Terra Magnetica and is a newsletter editor for IEEE Magnetic Society. 
Jeffrey Green will be speaking second. He's president of J.A. Green & Company, a Washington, D.C.-based government relations firm. Jeff most recently served as staff director to the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness. In that role, he was primarily responsible for all matters related to acquisition policy, <coughs> industrial-based issues, and uh, defense and trade and strategic materials. Currently, he represents a wide variety of clients in strategic and critical material sector, including rare earth, uh, among other things. Prior to his extensive legislative branch and Pentagon experience, Jeff served in the Air Force as a missile combat crew commander and continues to serve as a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force Reserve. He's written numerous articles on the defense industry and he's appeared on numerous news programs, including Fox News, BBC. He's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and numerous other uh, major news publications. A graduate of George Washington University, the University of Miami, and Cornell University, Jeff holds both a Master's of Law in Government Procurement and a Juris Doctor and is admitted to practice law in the District of Columbia, Florida, and New Jersey. Our third and closing speaker will be Tom Tanton. Tom's uh, someone I've known for a number of years now. We work on the energy issue uh, together. Mr. Tanton is president of T-Square Associates, a firm providing consulting services to energy and technology industries. T-Square Associates are active primarily in the area of renewable energy and interconnected infrastructures, analyzing and providing advice on their impact on energy prices, environmental quality, and regional economic development. Mr. Tanton is also Director of Science and Technology Assessment with the American Traditions Institute. He has 40 years direct responsible experience in energy technology and legislative interface. As General Manager of EPRI from 2000 to 2003, Mr. Tanton was responsible for overall management and direction of collaborative research and development programs. He's also served in the, uh, in the public sector uh, he was a principal policy advisor to the California Energy Commission in Sacramento, California. Began his career there in 1976. Without further ado, Gareth Hatch. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I thought what I would do to kick things off is uh, just give a, a brief uh, outline on what the rare earths are. Um, it's a, obviously an important uh, topic. We have a panel here on this today. Um, and then talk a little bit about the uh, current and supply situation. Let's kick things right, right, off right away. Uh, Rarists are important because they exhibit uh, some very special properties. Um, I'm a technical guy. I get excited about, uh, about the science of these things. Um, uh, we can do some really remarkable things uh, with, with rare earth metals. Um, they underpin uh, modern technology. Uh, they've been described as the, the, the vitamins of uh, of modern technology, and, and, and we exploit all kinds of uh, wonderful properties associated with them. And by doing that, we're able to have a, a really a profound effect on the, the operation of some very complex uh, systems. Uh, anything from uh, uh, your computer hard drive to, to your vehicle to wind turbines and all of the other things that uh, uh, make, make modern life tick. Um, so very quick. Uh, uh, lesson on the periodic table. I know you may see this again later, but the uh, the elements highlighted in green here are generally considered uh, to be the the rare earth elements. At the bottom, you have the uh, the lanthanoids uh, from lanthanum through to lutetium, and then you have a couple uh, at the top, scandium and yttrium. The industry as a whole generally doesn't talk a lot about scandium. You will hear scandi scandium discussed. It is an important, uh, potentially important element. Um, but it, it isn't generally found in the same places as, the, as these other materials. And promethium there on the bottom doesn't generally occur uh, in nature. So basically when, when we're talking about rare earths, we're generally talking about these 15 elements. And uh, I won't try and pronounce uh, all of these this morning, but uh, basically you can see uh, the 15 elements uh, listed here. The industry and uh, policymakers also talk about light rare earths and heavy rare earths. Okay, and it's always important to, to define our our definitions if we're going to talk about them. Um, whenever I put this slide up, um, I, I feel the scientists and the geologists in the audience start to cringe a little because this isn't the definition that they would use, uh, and frankly, nor would I for these elements. There are some special 
uh, distinctions uh, at the electronic level, which we won't get into this morning. But the industry as a whole refers to these five elements, lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, and samarium, as the light rare earths. So you may hear companies uh, talk about a light rare earth uh, project, or we need heavy rare earths, or there's a shortage of heavy rare earths. And this, this is to kind of help you get a, a feel for what they're talking about. So if these are the lights, then obviously these are the, uh, in the industry uh, perspective, these are the, the, uh, the heavy rare earths, uh, these 10 here. When we talk about heavy rare earths or heavy rare earth projects, um, generally we're talking about them on the basis of their potential value to the supply chain and their importance in terms of access to these elements not overall tonnage. Um, again, this isn't a geology lesson, so just, just bear in mind that uh, heavy rare earths are uh, much rarer than light rare earths. Uh, they're generally much more valuable to companies that are trying to produce them. Um, they may also occur in some very, uh, what are euphemistically called challenging minerals, very difficult to process. Um, and actually not all of those elements that you saw on the previous slide have actually had extensive research done on them. And one of the reasons for that is that these elements are notoriously difficult to separate one from another. And it's only in the last few decades that scientists have been able to do that uh, to purity levels that have allowed them to, uh, to do what they do. And the result of that has been some quite remarkable technologies. Uh, and one or two of them, frankly, don't have a whole lot of uh, uses yet, but if we can get more of them, then who knows, uh, who knows what, what we may have, might be able to do with them. Um, this is a slide that we may see later on today. Um, there's been a lot of work done, particularly with the Department of Energy, to look at the criticality of metals. Uh, certainly rare earths um, have been an important part of that work that the DOE has done. And this is a summary of, of the results of their work. This was published uh, at the end of last year. They're, uh, I believe, working on, a, on an update, and I believe we have a speaker later on today from the DOE, perhaps, who will talk about this. The takeaway here is that the uh, six elements in the short term that the DOE believe to be of critical importance, uh, five out of the six are rare earth elements with dysprosium being the most critical. <clears throat> in the long term, five out of the five elements are rare earth elements. And what do they mean by critical? Well, it's a combination of looking at the risk of supply for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be geopolitical. Uh, could, it could be lack of access to new sources um, that have been developed recently, as well as the importance of these elements to clean energy and clean technology. And really, you could swap out clean energy on the, uh, on the y-axis for defense, uh, for general industry. Uh, these elements are, are critical for a range of, of reasons. We did some work uh, earlier this year comparing the, the demand projections from the Department of Energy with um, projections of supply. Um, and this is a busy slide, but essentially the takeaway here is that for a number of, of rare earths, it would appear that, and this is really, a, frankly, a slightly optimistic scenario, for a number of rare earths, it's going to be a while before we have access to these materials on a permanent basis, um, not in deficit, not having to worry about uh, the supply chain, uh, with certainly uh, a dysprosium possibly 2016, 2017, before we've got steady supplies, assuming that the projects currently underway come on stream. So it is an issue. I'm, I'm very much a supply chain kind of person in, in the sense that uh, folks need metal. Uh, they're not so interested in uh, increasing their share prices by, or, or increasing the share prices of companies by investing. They need metal. They need to make stuff. They need access. They need security of supply. So a chart like this is a little bit scary uh, to those guys. So I'm going to quickly go through what I consider the good news, potentially good news is that certainly um, a vast majority of materials are currently coming from China, but there, are, there is hope. There is hope. There is material outside of China uh, that we can access. Last year, uh, our estimates are that China produced something around 119,000 tons of uh, rare earths uh, in total, uh, give or take. That's a sort of order of magnitude. 
uh, compared to around four and a half thousand, uh, perhaps uh, total in in the world. So you're looking at about 123,000 tons of material. In the grand scheme of things, that's actually not a lot of uh, mass compared to hundreds of millions of tons of other metals that are produced. But uh, as I said before, these are these are very important elements for a variety of of applications. So I'm just going to quickly, I'm not, these will be some busy slides, but I'm just going to kind of go through them. I'm going to show you where some of the projects are around the world that are currently um, under development. If we start with um, existing uh, sources of, of supply. So um, these are three of the um, main producing mines in, in China. Uh, the northern part is, uh, is in, a, in a Mongolia. You've also got a couple down here. It's a little bit produced in, in the Kolar Peninsula of Russia, uh, some in, in India, and Mountain Pass in California, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, is producing material uh, from previously mined um, uh, tailings. <coughs> um, in the next few years, there are so the next couple of years, uh, we may well see production from uh, Mount Weld in Australia. There's a couple of projects underway in, in India and Vietnam, project in, in South Africa. Uh, this, these are projects that are at the engineering or construction stage. They're in the latter stages of, of getting up and running. Uh, a little further out, you have projects that are what we call uh, in pilot plant stage. They're still figuring out the chemistry, uh, some of the, the detailed economics of their processes. Um, <clears throat> an important source for heavy rare earths would be up in Canada. Um, certainly, uh, Mountain Pass is, is currently uh, redeveloping its, uh, its setup to, to, to put material out. But you start to see some more of these dots in, in Australia, uh, one in uh, Kyrgyzstan and, and one in Africa. Um, projects that are further out, uh, pre-feasibility studies, um, it, they're looking at the preliminary economics. These companies bear large in uh, in Wyoming, um, Strange Lake in, in Quebec, Cavanafeld in Greenland, and I'll just put the next two up, up together. Finally, we have projects that are, they've done the minimum amount of work, they've done drilling, they've kind of started to figure out exactly what they have in the ground, so um, they can, with a minimum level of confidence, say we've got a particular uh, mineral resource. Um, and so I, I guess the takeaway here is that Certainly China, is, China currently dominates supply, um, but there are opportunities in North America and in Australia. Uh, there is material in the ground. There's a lot of work uh, going on right now uh, to, to find and define these resources, um, but it's by no means a slam dunk, okay? I think there's been an assumption that since there is all this activity, then the problem is solved, okay? Uh, the problem isn't solved, and this is probably going to come out in the, in the panel today. Um, there are a lot of parameters that could impede the development of these projects. Okay? So it's important. So the good news is there are sources, potential sources of supply outside of China. Um, the bad news is that these, these projects need a lot of help. So with that, I will, I will conclude. I'll just say that we've uh, published some of this data, uh, which is available from uh, from our website at a critical rare earths uh, report. And with that, I'll hand back to Sterling. Thanks. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff Green, and I'd like to talk to you today about the national security implications of the rare earth supply chain, uh, since we are talking about some of the defense risks here. Uh, I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch trying to discuss national security implications, and I found over the last three years uh, people's attitudes have really changed. Uh, when I first started taking this issue to the Hill years ago, people would say, well, there's, you know, there's plenty of material out there. We don't produce much of it in the U.S. We haven't seen a supply chain interruption. Clearly, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, then the last 18 months to a year, people have said, well, we have sources of supply coming online in the United States and Australia. Clearly, this is not a problem. We shouldn't worry about it. Uh, and then we saw the Chinese embargo, uh, the Japanese official on official. It uh, doesn't really matter. Supply shortages uh, appeared around the world. Prices increased 3, 10, 15 times per element. Uh, and people started to say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we really do have a problem here. 
So I've got four more slides here than I could possibly go through today, but what I want to talk about uh, in my abbreviated version are three things. The supply chain and what it looks like uh, outside of China, the U.S. government response to the rare earth issue, and finally some policy recommendations on what we can do. As Gareth mentioned, uh, the rare earths can be divided into heavies and lights. I like to put a, a group in the middle, uh, medium rare earths. Uh, I put this yellow box in the middle because depending on what type of deposit you have and depending on how you want to categorize yourself, you can say, hey, I'm a, I'm a heavy rare earth project. I've got uh, some samarium. So lots of different technical definitions out there. The key point here is make sure you know what you're looking at when people describe their deposits. Uh, lights on the left. Uh, places like Mountain Pass and Mount Weld in Australia, uh, heavy rare earths on the right, uh, no active producers of heavy rare earths outside of China today. Uh, this is a great slide to take to Capitol Hill. Uh, people get scared when they see all that red, I think they should. Um, this is rare earth out world output in 2010. As Gareth mentioned, there are some other producers um, outside of the United States, um, not significant, not significant at this point. Uh, critical applications, uh, I like to say it's easier to find a defense system uh, that has rare earths than does not have rare earths. I, I challenge you to find something, uh, some major program that doesn't have rare earths that touch it in some way. Uh, may not be a huge amount, but it's the old for one of a nail story. Uh, a little bit means a lot if the system won't work without it. Uh, supply chain, this is where I think um, people get, apparently my slides are going on without me. Uh, this is where I think people get confused. There's many different segments of the supply chain, and I think what Dr. Hatch was talking about really stops at the oxide level. Uh, so there are about 300 plus, according to TMR's good research, almost 400 what I'll call exploration or mining companies. These are companies that say, hey, I have a rare earth deposit. They'll come to Washington. They'll say, you know, we can provide this material. We've got a whole lot of it in the ground. That's great, and that's very encouraging, but to actually get to material that industry can use is a, a long window. When the GAO looked at this, uh, they came up with about a 15-year gap to go from this, hey, I've got it in the ground, I've drilled some core samples, and I found some promising results, to I can provide material to industry. So you look at ore. Uh, I've got a good defined ore body. I have to go through. I have to get it permitted. Roughly a 10-year process. Uh, I have to spend roughly $500 million in CapEx to dig it out of the ground to build a uh, chemical separation facility or a concentration facility with a mill and uh, basic chemical separation processes. And then I have to get into the really difficult part of making rare earths, which is here, uh, coming up with 17 or however many you want to put in different uh, separation cells. Uh, I can't just dig rare earth out of the ground like gold or silver, uh, separate it and send it to market. I need to dig it out, I need to concentrate it, take it down to a small particle size, then I need to put it through a very complex uh, separation process to come up with a single rare earth. And each time I do that, I have to have a separate physical facility and a separate line in my separation plant to make samarium, to make neodymium. Very complex, very expensive. Uh, right now, 97% of the world's production through oxide is going on in China. Uh, I argue that nearly 100% of production of the next step of reducing that oxide to metal is taking place in China. Uh, there is some small, I think it's captive production, it's up for debate. Uh, very little metal production uh, outside of China today. Uh, we get into the next step, combining those metals into alloys. Uh, a small amount of alloy production in the United States and the UK, uh, but still largely dominant in China. And then finally, production of the two um, uh, major types of rare earth magnets, if we want to talk just about the magnet supply chain, and there are many rare earth supply chains, whether you're talking phosphors or uh, chlorides or fluorides or, or whatnot, but let's just talk about magnets for a moment. The majority of rare earth magnet production is in uh, China, Japan, with very little in the United States today. Uh, I used to have this triangle facing up and say, here's the rare earth supply chain. Uh, I changed that because I think people failed to realize that this is just to get material that industry needs. What you have to think about is what goes on at the other end. Who takes the material? Uh, is it someone who takes a block of magnet and shaves it down into a final shape so that it can go into a component? Um, talking, say, a missile. Uh, is it then the subcontractor who takes that magnet and puts it in an actuator motor? 
is that the person that then takes the actuator motor and then puts it in the full tail fin kit of the JDAM, who then sells it to either the Department of Defense or the major defense contractor, a long way from end user in the defense world in the United States back to finding it in the ground. Uh, to break this down uh, a little bit differently, once you get to oxide, you spend your $500 million, you get your 97% of production uh, here in China. Uh, three companies that I know of that are con under construction, permitted, and financed, which I think is very critical to start getting back in this game. Uh, once they produce that oxide, we need to then come up with the next stage of the supply chain because just having oxide doesn't solve your problems. Uh, to take those metals, alloys, and powders, um, we then again go back into a primarily Japanese and Chinese supply chain at this point with a little bit of production coming online in Phoenix, uh, a little bit in Birkenhead, UK, a little bit in Troy, Michigan. Neodymium iron boron magnets. Uh, I think these are the, probably the best case study for why the rare earth issue is critical to national security. Uh, neodymium iron boron magnets currently today are produced uh, about 75% in China. These are the strongest, lightest, most resistant to demagnetization demagnet type of magnets, uh, arguably the most critical. Uh, we don't have the capability to produce these magnets in the United States for a couple reasons. One, there are no active producers with the equipment in place ready to do it. Uh, two, there is no one with the um, intellectual property or the licenses to produce this in the United States today. Uh, Japanese company Hitachi owns the patents for these materials. Uh, they have not issued a license in many, many years, and they have uh, simply refused to issue license to many uh, U.S. and I assume international companies who have pursued them uh, for a license to produce in the United States. Uh, that leaves us essentially dependent on the Japanese, who have been uh, cut off from their supply of oxides uh, and metals by the Chinese. Um, or reliant on the Chinese. Uh, three companies in the US have expressed interest in producing these, uh, but none of them are licensed at this point. Uh, I point to this block here, magnet distributors and fabricators. <clears throat> I've seen this in government reports where they say, well, look at all these US companies that say they produce neodymium iron boron magnets. Uh, and I think what's important to recognize here is uh, these folks take a block of magnet or a near net shape or a finished magnet put it into the supply chain and sell it. They're called distributor fabricators. They don't actually produce the magnet or give the magnet its magnetic moment or its magnetic uh, characteristic. So when you see companies, and you can go online and search US Neo Magnets, you'll find a lot of them. But you have to say, are they distributor fabricators or are they actually producers of, of the material? Uh, I'm going to skip through some of these. I'm not even going to cover these slides. I'm just going to say watch the arrows. This is the export of rare earth oxide into the United States since the late 90s. That thinning red arrow, decreased supply. Those blue arrows coming back, this is tech transfer. I think this is a key issue for national security. As the amount of material that goes to the United States decreases and goes to Japan decreases, we've seen a trend where increasingly companies have <coughs> moved production into China. So over the last six months, we've seen companies like, um, help me out here, Gareth, uh, Hitachi has discussed potentially moving magnet production into China. Uh, Shawadenko, an alloy and magnet producer, has discussed moving production into China. Uh, GM, GE, lots of major producers are talking about going to China. Well, why will they do that? Because this red arrow continues to get thinner and thinner. Without the inputs, without the raw material, companies are forced to secure their upstream and relocate to China. Uh, and it begs the question, how long until you continue to move through those triangles and then you're out of the rare earth supply chain into the component first line processor production supply chain where that half of the equation has to move to China to enable uh, continued production? Um, let me go quickly to what the US government has done. Uh, a little bit out of balance in my mind, lots of discussion uh, on Capitol Hill, many, many bills um, suggested, very few passed at this point. In the defense world, we've seen a progression of this issue. 
Uh, in the FY09 defense authorization bill, Congress said GAO review this. GAO looked at it, they came back, sure enough, they said, hey, there's a real issue here. That motivated Congress to come back in FY10 in the defense authorization bill and say, well, if there's a problem, maybe we should understand our supply and demand by element for critical materials. And if we see that supply does not equal demand, maybe the Department of Defense ought to know that. That report came out in interim version uh, this summer. A final version is expected in December. Uh, I'm very optimistic they're going to identify where they have supply chain risk. That begs the question, what do you do next? Well, the FY12 defense authorization bill has a uh, provision that passed the House. It's a, a pending in the Senate that says, well, how do we get an inventory of these materials? Come back to us, Department of Defense, and tell us what a rare earth inventory plan would look like. Should we stockpile these materials? Should they be a physical stockpile? Should it be a virtual inventory? Uh, should we just buy capacity so that we know that we can draw it out for the Department of Defense when we need it? How much should we buy? In what form? Should we buy oxide? Should we buy metal? Should we buy magnets? Uh, all those are open questions that are going to be looked at. Apologize, I'm tearing through these so quickly. I will be happy to give these to anybody. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so concerned about this is the way that this is being advocated in Washington, <clears throat> D.C. Uh, some companies will come to Washington, D.C. and say, hey, we need to vertically integrate the supply chain in the United States. We need to do it all here on U.S. soil. That's great on Capitol Hill. That plays extremely well. But when you look at the reality of what's going on in the market, this is very difficult. Uh, there's not a lot of demand for these materials in the United States, and anybody who's done basic business knows without demand, it's hard to do CapEx and put in capacity in the U.S. So what you've seen is uh, different branches coming off of this notional mind to magnets model in the United States where, well, maybe we'll take some concentrate uh, into Europe, or maybe we'll take it into Japan or other countries. I don't know exactly where it's going. Or maybe we'll take some oxide and bring that into Europe to produce some metal and some alloy. Um, it, it, uh, it goes all over the place. What I'm arguing uh, is that the United States really needs to consider multiple inputs. We need to think of different ways to ensure that we get to the end state. Uh, oxides, alloys, different non-Chinese companies all feeding into a supply chain, essentially uh, duplicity in your supply chain to make sure that you can hedge against risk. Uh, last point, what are we arguing for? Uh, I'm arguing that this defense inventory uh, is would be the appropriate way to do this, not arguing for a physical stockpile, but arguing for an offtake agreement where those various different branches that I've shown you, those various producers of oxide, metal, and alloy, all are called upon by the Department of Defense to guarantee delivery of a small percentage of the demand for the Department of Defense. Because without that demand in the United States, uh, companies are not incentivized to set up operations in the United States. Uh, I'll be happy to get in more of this. I don't want to take any more time. Just before Tom t speaks, I wanted to mention that uh, to the extent allowed by the speakers, all the presentations will be posted uh, on one site by the NCPA, so you'll have access to their slideshows and such. My name is Tom Tanton. As Sterling mentioned, I'm president of T Squared and Associates. I came to the energy arena during the original OPEC embargo back in the mid 70s. We're experiencing that again today, but the difference is that we're, we've gone from a cartel to a monopoly, and that monopoly is, is called China. I'm also Director of Science and Technology Assessment for the American Tradition Institute, which is a 501c3, uh, headquartered in the West, and also headquartered in uh, Washington, D.C. It's an environmental law center. We have pending a lawsuit against the University of Virginia and Michael Mann for hiding uh, information regarding his studies on climate change. We also have a lawsuit in Colorado Federal District Court uh, questioning the constitutionality of that state's renewable portfolio standard. And I won't go into any more about that right now, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Rare earth uses, you've heard about the supply side. Let's talk a little bit about the demand side. It's basically everything that makes modern life enjoyable, from your cell phone to your computer, military weapons for our protection and security, environmental products such as wind turbines, and, and then everything else, everything else. Production trends 
uh, you see China taking over, and they have established their own monopoly. They've established their own uh, market perturbation behavior. Uh, the virtual embargo to Japan a little while back, and then I just recently heard that they've put a one-month moratorium on the export of any rares to anybody. So, so we're in a, a risky situation, but we're making it worse for ourselves here in the United States. Two ways, we're increasing demand for rare earths through various programs and subsidies, such as for uh, renewable energy technologies. One of the largest users of rare earths are wind turbines, and we're paying 50% of the cost to install wind turbines through federal tax policies. And 39 states have renewable portfolio standards that further increase the demand for wind turbines <coughs> and, and hence for rare earths. We're also a little fortunate or unfortunate. We have plenty, whatever plenty means, rare earth deposits. I'm from California. California is the home of the only domestic producer of rare earths right now, but there are other projects in various stages of development. You heard earlier that it takes 15 years to get from you know, a core drill to actual production. A large amount of that is due to uh, the licensing process and the permitting process. The permitting process includes multiple layers. You may be straddling a boundary between Indian lands and Bureau of Land Management lands and state lands and other federal lands and private lands. How do you get a combined permit to extract that mineral resource? There's also conflicts in permitting. The state may require you to do something different than the federal may require you to do. An example I use is uh, drilling for geothermal fluids. Geothermal fluids provide hot water for power plants, primarily in the West. But interestingly, most of them that have a sal hot saline uh, resource are making more money on extracting metals and minerals from that hot saline water than they are from selling electricity. If we were to take the geothermal permitting and apply it to other mineral resources, things would hurry up a lot. Geothermal drilling and production is on an accelerated basis because our good friend Harry Reid thinks that geothermal is sliced bread and better, has encouraged BLM and others to accelerate the, the permitting for geothermal power plants. Well, pulling that hot saline water out, there, in Imperial Valley, California, there are geothermal power plants that are making more money selling zinc, not a very rare earth, but nevertheless, they're, selling, they're making more money selling zinc than they are selling electricity. And this is in California where electricity is expensive. There's also un unequal application of various environmental laws, like the Endangered Species Act. Companies in resource development, oil production, coal extraction, rare earths, are subject to a different threshold of damage when it comes to endangered species than favored technologies, like wind turbines and photovoltaics. If I put up a wind farm, I'm allowed to kill, through my incidental take permit, you know, 50 or 100 endangered birds every year. And it's happening today in Altamont Pass. But if I'm in mineral extraction or oil production or coal production, every bird I kill is a $100,000 fine. And I cannot get an incidental take permit. That doesn't seem to make sense. Perhaps the worst thing is at a time when the issue is supply, we're encouraging demand. I'd like them to be a little bit more in sync. Get rid of programs, get rid of policies, get rid of incentives that inflate, artificially inflate and overheat demand for products that are in short supply and subject to a monopoly. And I'm talking about the production tax credit. There are other examples uh, where we're, we're, we're pushing on the wrong end of the string. What's the answer? I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase a phrase that was used 
um, a, a few years back of drill, baby, drill. Well, what we need to do here in the United States is dig, baby, dig. And it's not just rare earth uh, minerals, but it's others as well. If you want questions or comments, or even if you have complaints, uh, feel free to contact me at that information. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to open it up now for questions. Remember, uh, I'll recognize the questioner, ask that you wait till the microphone gets there, um, and direct it, if possible, to one panelist or another. In any time in the near future, can the heavies be produced in the West? Uh, not only mine, but actually producing the products. So certainly there are... Um, I will say this, there are heavy rare earths present in, uh, at, Mount, at Mount Weld, okay? It is, it is really dominated by light rare earths, but there are some heavy rare earths present. And also at Steenkunskra, which is in South Africa. Um, but there's not enough in those, those projects. There's a tiny amount at, at, at Mountain Pass. Uh, technically, there are heavies at Mountain Pass, but uh, nothing significant. So yes, we are we are in a bit of a pinch when it comes to the, the heavy rare earths. We, we don't really see significant sources of those elements coming on stream um, any time before 2015. Uh, new sources. When it comes to the U.S., there are certainly um, a couple of, of notable projects. Uh, one is up in Alaska, the Boken Mountain project um, that does uh, contain appreciable amounts of, of heavy rare earths um, and uh, there's also project Bear Lodge uh, recently announced uh, they found heavy rare earth mineralization and their property and there are a number of other uh, properties and projects in the US that um, haven't yet uh, done what we call a mineral resource estimate so sort of minimum level of modeling and data crunching to say, okay, we think we've got this amount of, of material of this type, um, but it is it is uh, possible that there are such projects. But as, as Jeff and, and the others have said, the timeline, even if you were starting today, the timeline uh, to bring those on stream uh, is considerable. And so we're still stuck with this four or five year period of uncertainty when it comes to heavy rare earth supply. But I, I would like to add a little bit to that as well, that in addition to looking for more supplies of the heavies, we also need to look for alternatives to the use of the heavies. And the applications themselves, just as we did in petroleum, and it, it, you know, refineries used to be just using light sweet crude. Now they, now they handle anything up to ore emulsion and there was some move on you know, to use coal. But if we, if we, if we release the innovators in the United States to come up with alternative <clears throat> to those heavies, you know, maybe it'll relieve some of the demand pressure as well. What, one of the ironies there, of course, is that our ability to use the heavier crude oil was a result of using rare earths in the catalyst for those uh, processes. So, if, if I could add, the one thing I would would note is I think we need to be very careful about uh, just accepting that we're going to have an oversupply of rare earths in the near future. Uh, as we've seen, production delays certainly can happen in this industry. Uh, and to assume the United States is going to have an oversupply, I think, is a very risky assumption. We're talking about a facility in the United States that would be the largest facility of its kind ever built that's not currently uh, constructed uh, with the highest recovery rate ever achieved at the lowest price in the world. I think those are very uh, ambitious and lofty goals, and I think we need to be very conservative in accepting that uh, as something that's going to happen. Um, the other thing that's the wild card here is we don't know what the Chinese are going to do as far as their production. We've seen a, a production a halt in the Baotou region as the Chinese have seen prices begin to creep back. Uh, their response has been, well, we're just not going to produce. Uh, and you can argue whether that's for environmental cleanup reasons or to keep prices high in the market. Uh, so we don't know what they'll do as far as production. We don't know what they'll do as far as export quotas. So I'm, I'm not uh, as optimistic that even the light issue will be solved in the very near future. I wondered if the panelists could speak to DOD's interest in this. Uh, national security carries a lot of weight. 
And I understand there's a certain amount of reluctance. Perhaps you could explain that and uh, give us some insights over whether we can see a, a rebirth of interest, if you will, at DOD. Well, I'll start on that. I've been tracking this very closely. <clears throat> I think we've seen a progression in the mindset from the Department of Defense on this. Uh, about, a, about a year ago, shortly after the GAO report came out, uh, the Department of Defense said, well, we're doing an internal assessment on this as well. And that internal assessment was never released. Uh, but we did get some peeks into what some of the thinking was. There were some public statements uh, by some political appointees there who said, well, you know, I wouldn't rush out and buy rares. There's going to be plenty on the market. Uh, you know, there's going to be an oversupply. The free market's going to fix this. Then Congress pushed back a little bit with their 843 report, uh, which is still pending, and said, you know, DOD, I think you need to take a closer look at this. Uh, they did. They came out with an interim report this summer, which uh, no one has seen outside the government. Uh, it's for official use only. Uh, but then something very interesting happened, I believe, in August. Uh, the annual industrial capabilities report was released by the Department of Defense, about a hundred and some odd page document. And within it, there were two or three pages on rare earths. And for the first time, they acknowledged there is a rare earth supply shortage. These are critical to national security. Uh, we do have national security risk associated with this. I think that was a tremendous, uh, tremendously important acknowledgement by DOD uh, that, that something is amiss here. Uh, we will see the final report in December. I think we're very optimistic to see what the conclusions are. There's no guarantee that that will be released to the public. Uh, but from conversations I've had, uh, uh, perceptions are changing. I think people are really realizing this. And I think most importantly, as anything in the Department of Defense, users, program managers, people in uniform are starting to understand the risk associated with this. So whereas before, uh, many political types were looking at this and saying, ah, it's a free market issue. Today, many people in uniform are looking at it and saying, well, can I operate my, or can I execute my operational plan? Can I accomplish the mission if my supply of these materials is disrupted? And I think that's a very important shift. I'd like to uh, take a little moderator's prerogative and interject. Um, not to just most recent statement, but to his previous statement concerning the supply issue. And I'm also not sanguine uh, about the future supply domestic production. And the reason is, as he said, China's production policy. Everyone talks about China's um, embargoes and cutting off supplies. Uh, but no one talks much about their ability to flood the market and to sustain lower prices and even losses for a considerable period of time for strategic reasons. You can invest hundreds of millions of dollars into a new mine uh, to produce rare earths or to a refining facility uh, and see that wiped out in a very short period of time if China chooses to flood the market uh, and sustain that. If you don't have large capital backing you for an extended period of time where you can sustain losses, then you'll go under. And the question is, if you, if companies are put under once or twice again, how many times are people going to invest in the mining of those technologies, uh, the mining of those uh, materials, uh, if they know at any minute China can, can put them out of business? Uh, just a statement that the, in the U.S. we have a tariff system and, uh, you, know, you know, there's the WTO, which people that can appeal and so nothing can really happen there but Congress has the right to impose tariffs on China or any other country that tries to drop the price uh, or you know to, to prohibit exactly what you say of, of happening so that uh, people will not you know if, if someone wants to buy it from China that the price can be kept up uh, if they want to ship it in here at, a, at four dollars uh, the U.S., you know, will be protected by that $100 uh, tariff, either by percentage or ad valorem. So, so there is things that are, are out there to protect that. Uh, the other option is, of course, uh, having venture uh, capital people uh, go forward and buy up that cheap material, exactly what the Chinese don't want us to do. Um, you know, that's, that's just a couple observations. The other one is, of course, the shutdown. Uh, Molly Corp, in the past, when they were at full production, every year they would shut down for a, a whole month, typically the month of August, just to do run maintenance, you know, lubrication, 
replace parts that are, you know, uh, wear out uh, periodically. And so uh, this shutdown is purely something that they might have done do every year, although they may be doing it just to, to do it and, and publicizing it just to get the price up. So you need to be very careful of what the Chinese say because of, you know, other people have, you know, they're now, you know, uh, known as the empire of lies. So it's a, a you know, socio-economic and political area where anything that comes out of there is suspect. So you have to be very careful on, on what the perceptions are. So, so sure. Those comments. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next. Okay. Um, in January, we were told that China was nationalizing its rare earth industry. What are the implications, if that's true, what are the implications of that nationalization for uh, national security? <clears throat> from, from my perspective, it doesn't change things much at all. Um, whether it's a, a government-owned rare earths company or a private-owned rare earths company subject to the whims of the Chinese government, I don't think really makes much difference. And if you, if you look at the situation with respect to petroleum, for example, 95% of the world's petroleum is controlled by government-owned oil companies. But they're not government-government, they're you know, government-owned companies. So I don't really think if they nationalize it'll make much difference uh, on the bottom line. I, I would just add that um, the authorities in China for a number of years have set mining quotas, they've set production quotas, they've set export quotas. Um, uh, some of this is handled at the provincial level, some of it at the national level. So uh, regardless of who technically owns um, or receives the profits from the, these companies, um, the, the rare earth industry, as many industries in China, um, is very much controlled by the government anyway, and, and what they do as a monolithic entity is controlled al already. I mean, I, the, the news in the last 12 months has, I think, been more focused on two or three activities, one of which is consolidation uh, in terms of the infrastructure and the bureaucracy. Um, I think from, from talking to people in China, there is a legitimate desire to close down some of the most uh, egregious, uh, polluting, um, uh, uh, factories and facilities. Um, there is an excess of capacity in China already, uh, 250,000 tons by some estimates, which is double the world uh, production. So you can either look at that as, as being quite scary that they could you know, ramp up production and, and, and kill the market, or you could look at it as adding some credence to the fact that they want to get rid of some of these uh, uh, facilities and streamline and make more money. I mean, I, I, I'm a little less, uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that the Chinese plan to flood the rest of the world with, with cheap uh, material. There are a lot of happy people in China right now making a lot of money on the current prices. And I think certainly you've got to consider this from the national security point of view and the implications, but um, the, the amount of money that's, that's flowing into the coffers in China right now is certainly um, making some people very happy. So I think it's in their interest to keep prices um, higher than they've been historically, even if there'll be some volatility in the next few years. Hi. Um, could any of the uh, speakers point out, is there a comprehensive study out there, you know, that's kind of a benchmark that uses, you know, I think Tom talked about OPEC in the 70s, you know, when it was going to be $100 a barrel of oil and, you know, advanced cycle times and, you know, things that really changed a lot in these industries and a lot of the things that you're saying, you know, long cycle times, prices, supply and demand out of whack. We've known that over time that takes care of itself. OPEC, you know, proved a lot of those kinds of things. They could have so is there, is there one kind of comprehensive study that the government has maybe sponsored that looks like, you know, it's a pretty balanced study rather than just, you know, crisis or complacency? 
I think there's a number of studies out there right now. In fact, this issue is really being studied to death, which uh, those of you that, that work the Hill know is, is usually the easiest thing to do is let's study something. Uh, you've seen the DOE critical materials strategy, which came out last year, and I think Gareth did a nice job of capturing the materials that they defined as most at risk. And we uh, know that a second uh, update to that is coming. Um, it lays out the problem. It doesn't get to uh, strategies or solutions. Uh, the Department of Defense undergoing their own assessment. Um, again, we hope it gets to strategies and solutions, and that annual industrial capabilities report I referenced actually had five or six risk mitigation strategies, which was very encouraging. It's the first time I've seen it. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy has an interagency working group where all the stakeholders are brought forward, uh, but to my knowledge, there's no plan to come up with a comprehensive study. Um, and I would actually turn to Gareth to talk about the, the numerous industry studies, including his own, that have been done. Yeah, there's been a, a, a handful of, uh, of studies. There's also, uh, I mean, obviously there's a, an understandable focus on, on U.S. and domestic um, uh, research and, and interest here, but there's certainly been some good work done in Europe. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, useful studies there. Uh, they're generally in the context of critical materials as a whole, of which rare earths are a, are a subset. Um, but I, I would say that, that I would echo what, what Jeff um, has said. Um, there's a lot of paperwork being generated by this, by this problem. Um, on the other hand, there are uh, some reports, some things circulating in Japan, for example, that, that I've been trying to track down. Uh, there's a country that identified this as a problem a number of years ago, uh, is quietly going about its business trying to secure uh, supplies outside of, of China, outside of Japan. They don't have resources in Japan. Um, and there is very much a sense of, of um, you know, partnership, I think, between the private sector and, and the government. Um, in terms of making some of those things happen. So it, it can be done, um, and some of this information is shared. It's a little difficult to get uh, from, from the Japanese. Um, but uh, as I said, a, there was actually just a report last week uh, issued by Chatham House in, uh, in London uh, on this. I haven't had a chance to look at it in great detail. I suspect it's probably more of the same, um, but we'll see. Thank you. I was just wondering what you consider to be the potential for recycling uh, of these various uh, hardwares out there to recover the uh, rare earth elements. I, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I'm actually, uh, I have to be careful what I say here, um, I think there is significant potential for recycling of, of uh, materials and components to contain rare earths. I think the conventional thinking has been that it's um, not, not economical, but when you actually dig deeper, nobody's really actually studied <laughs> uh, processes and, and the economics of this. So, um, you know, one obvious concern is that if you've used metals in, in very low dilute quantities uh, and they're dispersed, that it becomes difficult to gather those materials and reconstitute them as, uh, as new materials. So there are places you can start with that. Um, there are a number of initiatives to, to, to do that. Um, but we're not going to recycle our way out of this problem. That's, that's for sure. I mean, I think there are sound you know, in, environmental uh, reasons and, and practical reasons, but we're not going to recycle our way out of this. And the other point is many of the components that are using these materials now, whether it's uh, in, in electric vehicles or hard drives or whatever, uh, wind turbines, they're going to be in service for 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years, so we can't wait that long to then have that material put back into the system. So, I think you've, you've touched on something that in my mind is one of the, the traps that the government may be falling into. Uh, so I already expressed my concern that we're studying this issue a lot, um, but that's important. We, we need to get there. Uh, the second thing that concerns me about government action is we've, uh, in many sectors, adopted a mantra. We need to reduce, reuse, recycle, and substitute. <coughs> That's great, but if worldwide demand for these materials increases, regardless of those strategies, you're still going to have a production deficit. Uh, those are things that government can do. They can put money into R&D. Uh, they can put it into recycling programs. 
uh, they can look at those. There's programs out there in the Department of Energy and Defense that are designed to do that. What gets more difficult is stimulating production. Uh, there aren't a lot of widely used vehicles and there's not a lot of government resources to promote production and production from multiple companies at various segments of the supply chain. And I think ultimately that's the tough nut the government's going to have to crack is uh, if we do all these other risk mitigation strategies, what I call the easy stuff, uh, the high risk, high reward stuff, at the end of the day, there's still going to be large demand within the United States. We're going to have to look at things like the Defense Production Act and the defense stockpile uh, to stimulate um, uh, companies in the United States and, and ally nations to actually get into production. Jeff, um, uh, companies like TDK, for example, I think you had them in your graph, have said that they'll just substitute for Rees if they can't um, if they can't get supply or if they can't get economic supply. How does the military feel about substitutability? Is it, is it a real option for the military? Uh, I don't want to sound cynical, but I, I see that kind of thing in discussion, and I see that on paper, and, and there are claims, you know, well, if, if uh, we can't get neodymium magnets for a JDAM, we'll, we'll just substitute them out. We'll redesign the missile. And I bang my head against the wall and say, but for the money you're going to spend to redesign a weapon system, to use old technology, last generation technology, you're going to spend millions of dollars in requalification and substitution just for one system. Wouldn't it make more sense to put production in at a much lower cost to ensure you have supply of that material? I mean, I think for a company uh, that has supply issues, it's very appealing to the market to hear, well, we'll just substitute that out. You know, I think for the government, it's very appealing to say, well, we can just substitute those materials away. It's a good way to make it go away on paper. But practically, when you dig a little deeper on the cost of that substitution, uh, I think you come up with a different answer. I would, I would just add to that that uh, we use railroads for a reason. Uh, they have, as I said at the beginning, they got some very remarkable uh, properties. Uh, extremely difficult to to replicate at the materials level. You might you might see um, attempts to swap out, say, one type of component for another. But there, as as Jeff's alluding to as well, there are always trade-offs. There are always negative trade-offs, and uh, it does seem uh, a little silly, frankly, that that the emphasis is put on on substitution. Um, sub work on substitution is a is a, a worthwhile scientific endeavor. You know, but you're not going to be able to do that on, on demand and in the time frame that we need uh, these issues to be resolved. So I, I second what Jeff is saying. The emphasis should be on on uh, on getting those new new sources and, uh, and new new ways of producing these things uh, at, a, at a lower cost. Maybe what we need to do is put uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator on a production path to just make more. Rarers. I mean, you know, make make it out of zinc, make it out of lead, make it out of you know. The, I mean, the, the the alchemist dream is maybe being changed from making gold into making rarers. Can anyone speak to um, the another barrier to entry for junior mining? Um, the concerns over radioactivity in the in the process of mining rare earth. I know in Malaysia that's been a problem, right? I'll, I'll make a comment to start on that. Um, I just came from a, uh, a two-day event in Toronto that the TMR organized. It was a, a rare earth boot camp, and uh, uh, we brought in ge uh, geologists, scientists, uh, independent third parties to teach our audience um, about this subject. And one gentleman we brought in from ANSTO in uh, Australia, one of the leading um, groups that do work on processes for rare earths and I asked him to address this issue of, of radioactive materials um, for the audience um, his comment was in a nutshell that certainly there are legitimate concerns and legitimate issues when it comes to the handling of uh, radioactive materials that naturally occur with rare earths um, but there is a there is a um, there is, a, there is a, f a public fear of radioactivity that really uh, takes away from the ability of companies like Linus and others to properly communicate what it is that they're doing. Um, and frankly, the, the, the Malaysia story for me is more a, 
um, a story of miscommunication than, than real uh, potential uh, problems. Certainly there are things that need to be resolved, um, uh, but I think that that was really blown out of proportion, but this is, this is a problem with radioactivity. Um, I think next to pesticides, you know, radioactivity is the is the number one fear of, of, of the general public when it comes to technology. So I, I don't think, frankly, that um, from a technical point of view, it's it's not the issue that it's made out to be. Um, I will say this, that the issue of handling of radioactive materials like thorium, like uranium, and other things that are found with these rare earth materials as a policy, from a permitting point of view, is a key impediment, frankly, to the uh, more rapid development of projects, particularly in, in North America, and particularly in the USA. And it's definitely something that has to be addressed. Um, but it is part of a, a larger issue of how the public uh, feels and, and deals with radioactivity. Um, and of course, there's a, you know, it, it, at the heart of that, there's a good reason to be concerned about it. But it's about, I think for me, as a, as a technical person, it's about communicating that properly and reassuring people. So, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that. This will be the last question. This is more of just a comment, but uh, as a history lesson back in World War II, when we kind of had our backs against the wall and we saw that we needed a significant supply of oil, we had to, America eventually built a pipeline from the East Texas oil field all the way to New York where we could process the oil and, and so forth. It seems like America has to be its back against the wall before we ever make policy, money, loans you know, available for uh, uh, advancement to, to help America. So this is a comment that we, we've done it before, but it's been a while before we put the kind of money we need behind uh, this operation. So. You know, this is a story that I, I try to take to the Department of Defense, it seems like weekly. Um, and I try to tell them our backs are against the wall and people don't seem to realize it. We've seen the Chinese already exert their influence over the global market and cut off uh, one of our key allies from a source of supply of key material. But what's more scary to me is we've seen the technology transfer and the relocation of downstream manufacturing capability like uh, Shawadenko and GE and GM and these other, uh, Toyota was the other one I forgot to mention. When we see those commercial interests moving into China for production, that scares me because how long will it be until one of our major defense contractors or their tier one or two suppliers also has to relocate to China uh, to produce critical weapon systems? And when that happens, it's too late to fix it. So I argue that the crisis is here now. Uh, we just need to find people with the political will to recognize that and to take action to fix it. We, we need to be a little cautious, though, to make sure we do it right. During World War II, the concept of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was, was created. That hasn't been always the best run program. There's a difference between doing the right thing, like an SPR or a Strategic Rare Earths Depository or something, and doing the thing right. The way the SPR has been run is it's always, you know, filling up when petroleum prices are at the highest and drawing it down when we think, you know, oh, well, prices are, are moderate now, so we'll draw it down. It, it's operated sort of bass backwards, you know, and I would hate for, for a rare earth strategic something uh, to be uh, handled in the same fashion. I think there's a lot that demands it. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, let's thank all the panelists.